Um, uh, it's, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm still a, a learner about uh, Irish energy policy. I have only, um, in the last six months, uh, become uh, much more involved uh, in, in Irish policy. Uh, as the uh, Commission's um, uh, designated expert on, on the European semester with regard to energy. Uh, and so I'm still learning, uh, and I beg your indulgence today if I say anything truly stupid or, or anything else, please accept my excuses in advance. Uh, the reason I'm here specifically to, today uh, is to talk about uh, networks uh, and renewables in particular from the Irish perspective, because we in Brussels think uh, that uh, Ireland has a particular role to play uh, immediately and over the long term for the, um, the achievement of uh, European goals for uh, renewables. Uh, and uh, what we are hoping is that we will see a, a much greater uh, expression of interest and involvement from uh, the Irish energy community and the Irish political community in leadership on, on uh, energy policy in this area because Ireland has so much to give, so much expertise, uh, and there is so much opportunity. It would be a shame for Ireland to, to miss that for the future. Now, um, I have some slides uh, which I'll go through very quickly. Uh, uh, I am also conscious that yesterday we had uh, the announcement of the European Energy Union in Brussels, which was as much as, as a surprise for me as perhaps it was for you, uh, because right up until the last moment the texts were being changed, uh, and I'm still not quite sure what we announced yesterday. But insofar that I can help you on any point, I'd be happy to help you on the, uh, on the Energy Union uh, as well in addition to what I'm going to say about networks and grids. So let me get uh, networks and grids out of the way uh, first off. Um, the first thing to, to bear in mind is that uh, we are now in a, a European energy market where uh, renewables in particular are cost competitive over the long term. So on what's called a levelized cost of electricity, uh, all renewables now are cost competitive to major uh, competitors. Uh, it's only really um, the two dirtiest uh, fuels, hard coal and brown coal, which retain a significant cost competitive uh, advantage uh, over other fuels. Uh, onshore wind is particularly cost competitive. Offshore wind uh, is uh, uh, in the money at some stages in the, in the, in the markets uh, and over the long term will get further into the money. German, in particular, photovoltaic, uh, is already uh, in the money in the Central European market. Uh, and there are lots of new technologies in the renewable sector which are coming on stream. And the interesting thing about renewables is, of course, that uh, in the majority of cases, there is no fuel cost. So once you have built the infrastructure and put everything in place, the marginal cost of the extra unit of power uh, is almost zero uh, and that leads to, in continental Europe, the perverse situation where uh, uh, you are paid to take electricity away. We've had several instances now of so-called negative prices where people are paid either to consume electricity or not to provide it. Uh, and uh, that has had a, a stunning effect on overall electricity prices, particularly in the core German and Danish markets. And in countries where there is... Uh, uh, a lower level of penetration of renewables, you tend to have higher uh, electricity costs. As you look across uh, northwest Europe in particular, you'll see uh, electricity prices uh, which are completely diverging. Uh, and wholesale baseload electricity in the first quarter of 2014 costs something in the region of uh, 30 uh, euros per megawatt hour in Germany and 60 euros per megawatt hour here in Ireland. And between Ireland uh, and Germany, you had another high price market, which was uh, the United Kingdom, which I think was about 55. Netherlands uh, was also higher than Germany. Uh, <coughs> Denmark was lower than um, Germany. Denmark and Germany 
uh, both have uh, the highest penetration of uh, renewables in Northwest Europe, uh, and the link between that and the wholesale electricity price should be established in every policymaker's mind. What we need to see in uh, Northwest Europe and in uh, 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 Ireland in particular is a, a much greater penetration of uh, renewables to bring down overall electricity prices, to break the link between hydrocarbon costs and electricity prices. In uh, our estimation, uh, the, germ uh, the, the um, Irish electricity price, which is very closely linked to the wholesale gas price, isn't necessarily a good long-term option uh, for Ireland. And indeed, I was joking with, with, with Eamon just now, saying that if I had thought that I would come to Ireland and say, I uh, know of a small European country which is de entirely dependent on a single gas interconnector for its electricity supply to a former imperial power, I would normally be thinking about Central Europe, not Ireland. But this is the case that in Ireland today, uh, the interconnector for the gas market is the single most important uh, element of security of supply and for price setting in the electricity market. And that is a particular concern for us in the European uh, Commission because it has implications for energy security and for long-term pricing of electricity in Ireland. And if Ireland wants to become much more competitive, it needs to think about how it's going to achieve much lower electricity prices over the medium to long term. Now, um, there are extremely good signs in uh, the Irish context. We've uh, seen the good news this week uh, from, from Apple with its investment in uh, Athenry. Athenry. Uh, which I think is a very good uh, vote of confidence, confidence for uh, the Irish economy and for the Irish energy system, particularly since uh, it is considered that it will uh, only use uh, renewables. I think that's very good. But I think there needs to be much more greater conception of uh, Irish energy policy which is linked towards industrial and general economic and general ecological welfare than simply the economics of single parts of the supply chain for gas to uh, the Irish economy. So... What then is the solution? Well, the solution that we would consider the most uh, uh, beneficial would be uh, a, a rapid expansion of uh, interconnectors. That would allow for uh, a greater amount of trade, electricity trade, between wholesale markets, and also in the future uh, for Ireland to take up its role as a potential exporter of green energy to the heart of Europe. If we look at all of the different types of uh, uh, climatic conditions that we have in the European Union. Uh, Ireland has a special uh, climatic position, I think, uh, but it means that that special climatic position gives it an advantage when competing against Spanish solar, German solar, such that there is sun in Germany, or all wind uh, in, in other parts of Europe. So uh, the peaks of supply or production in the Irish case will be different from the peaks of production in other areas. And having that interconnection with other countries would allow for exports of uh, uh, electricity from Ireland and when there's a deficit to, um, to import electricity when necessary. You also would move away from the conception of being dependent on a single gas supply system uh, through, uh, through to Moyle uh, in Scotland. So we would like to see uh, a much higher level of interconnection Firstly, starting with uh, trade between electricity markets, which would allow for thermal power optimization, particularly of natural gas, and would make the natural gas market equally much more competitive. So you could import natural gas to compete with the natural gas that you already can have in this country, which comes through a gas interconnector, but you could import it in the form of prices, electricity prices, from thermal power generated elsewhere. So if the gas price is lower, say, in Germany, you could import that electricity to uh, Ireland and have it compete with gas which is burnt in this country. We have looked at different uh, grid designs uh, in uh, the European context and we uh, uh, have noted that uh, grids which are uh, designed rather than left to the market are over time 
much more competitive and of much greater socio-economic value to all of the member states involved than simply allowing for a uh, grid that grows like Topsy. So uh, we are looking uh, in the context particularly of the Northern Seas, which are the Baltic, the North Sea, uh, the Irish Sea, uh, and the area around Ireland, uh, at uh, grid designs, uh, how we can remove development ba barriers, uh, and uh, think also about how we can uh, best uh, remunerate those who will build grids for the future. And perhaps we should move from a merchant-based system to a regulated asset-based system. We should also think in terms of scale, what, to, what it is the effect of scale on bringing down unit costs if we were to go down this route. And so far, as I think uh, um, I saw a press release from the Green Party this morning, which I think must have had your hand behind it, uh, um, I think you were bemoaning the, the thought that, uh, that uh, Ireland hadn't been at the table when the negotiations were taking place in, in Brussels. Indeed, you had. Uh, and you were deeply involved. But uh, we need, I think, also to, 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 to thank and to think, thank the Irish government for having done what it has done so far, but also think for the future, what could you do more? What is it uh, that Ireland could bring to uh, the, the table on a discussion uh, uh, about interconnecting systems over the long term? Uh, and one of the softer uh, values that I think... Um, uh, that you could certainly bring to the table is any initiative which is led by Ireland is generally accepted by everybody else because we don't think, the others that is, that Ireland has any hidden um, agenda, generally speaking. So uh, you at least uh, bring your good offices to the debate uh, and that can be very helpful in and of itself. But thinking for the future, I think there are things that uh, would be of tremendous value for Ireland. Exporting electricity when you have a surplus, importing cheaper electricity when you need it. Uh, also, there are management issues of the grid. There are things which speak to the uh, relative uh, um, um, forgotten the word in English um, advantages that Ireland has, such mm -hmm. as uh, software development, systems management, SCADA and such like. So there are other elements of the, uh, of the economic equation which you should think about when you're talking about networks which um, Ireland could particularly, particularly take part in. And we should also think about what is the role of wind, both onshore and offshore. We should think about whether there should be uh, a scope for uh, much greater um, cost compression in the wind sector, particularly in standardisation. There are, at the moment, a tremendous number of different wind turbines and wind components on the market. Uh, they all address the same issue, which is try to make something go round in the wind, but they all have tremendously different uh, technical uh, attributes. And to uh, standardise some of those technical attributes, to make systems much more simpler, uh, and to have a plug-and-play approach to electricity generation, particularly for wind power, would bring down its uh, costs tremendously. In the United Kingdom, they are thinking uh, of reducing costs by 40% uh, between now and 2020. If that's done in the European concept, it would be much easier to achieve that for all uh, uh, European wind farm manufacturers and operators. So when we look at grids for renewables expansion, should we think about having the renewables first and then the grids? Or should we think about having the grids and then the renewables? And that's a very important uh, timing issue. And uh, until now, most people have put, it in the, it put, put this uh, in, the, in the sequence that we should first develop the renewables and then develop the grids. The suggestion that we would make is to change it round. We should first put in place grids for trading of the existing infrastructure that we already have, the existing generation facilities that we already have, and then develop the renewables uh, that can take advantage of that grid at a later time. But you do, uh, if you go along that route, have to manage competing interests, you have to make anticipatory investments, and you have to think about what it is that you're going to do in common and what you're going to do 
apart. And that political process is not started uh, at the European Union level. There is an initiative called the Northern Seas um, Offshore Grid Initiative, and it's COGI, but it's a very technical level uh, initiative uh, dealing with specific uh, technical issues for regulation. What we really need, though, is a political initiative which takes in the whole of the North Sea, uh, Northern Seas area, and uh, which involves everybody from the start and has a political flavour to it. And I think that's where uh, Ireland could play a significant role. Grid designs, they're much cheaper if you think about them in uh, anticipation over time than if you just allow them to be built and then try and fix them later. I think the message there is that we need to have some sort of global perspective of what we're going to do in the North, Northern Seas in order for everybody to benefit. And to take these concepts and apply it to uh, the interconnected region of the Northern Seas, you'll see that if you have uh, a coordinated development versus a business-as-usual approach, you have far fewer uh, cables in the sea, which means far fewer costs, uh, and you have much simpler management uh, and uh, O&M costs over the long term. We would like to see a development more like this than like that. It has upfront additional costs, but it has, uh, over time, huge savings in comparison to a business-as-usual scenario. Uh, and such a coordinated development would allow for Ireland to uh, be fully integrated into the continental energy market, irrespective of what political circumstances may occur between now and its achievement. I think that's an important thing that Ireland has to consider. It's beyond my pay grade to go any further than that, but uh, I put it to you that it's important for Ireland to think about what happens in the future, in the long term, in its electricity sector now, rather than waiting three or four years. We need uh, a greater level of political uh, framework, uh, particularly uh, at the European Union level or at the regional level. We need something, an area of discussion, politically led, uh, where uh, these issues can be dealt with uh, and the um, expected benefits reaped. And again, I think Ireland has a strong claim to take leadership in that area. Uh, and lastly, what we need to do uh, in order to achieve a regionally integrated energy system in the Northern Seas is close all the different legal horizons, all the different bits of law and regulation and jurisdiction and other issues that come into play, do it in such a way that project developers have the fewest risks, the fewest problems in delivering a robust electricity uh, network and grid for a decarbonised, carbon-neutral Europe that we have in view for 2030. And I think that is something that is a great challenge to all of us, and I hope that having come to D Dublin, I'll at least get an echo on some of these points. Thank you, everyone.